Hi, Harry Dent here on April 6th, Monday. Uh, we have the markets opening up after our first big crash, and we could still be in for more of that. I'll get into that. Uh, just wanted to give everybody an update, an important update, more on the big picture here of what we are looking at and how people are going to misinterpret it. Um, the big confusion here is that this is all about the virus. People are asking me, oh, Harry, yeah, you have 40% crash. Yeah, we're having that, but, but that's the virus. No, you have to see here, the virus is a trigger, like the subprime crisis, remember that, it was building in, in bad loans. Uh, it was only 14% of consumer credit in the U.S. It was only four states it was concentrated in. And yet it caused a whole global downturn in stocks and recession and everything. This is not just a trigger, but it is the perfect trigger because money printing does nothing to stop the spread of this virus. Like everything, it can help cushion the economy, although we see that's happening less and less. You have to print more and more to have less and less effect. And I'm going to get into the most important point a little later this morning. Now, real quickly. I just saw a survey from RCB Capital, 400-ish institutional clients considered smart money, a smart money indicator. And two-thirds of that group, the overwhelming majority, basically had a similar scenario to what I've been seeing amidst this crash, that we've got one more downturn to come in the markets, and their target's about 2,100 on the S&P. Well, you know, that's very close to my 2080 target, which could go as low as 2050 as so it's stretched out, on the S&P 500 for my megaphone pattern short term. So again, that is the most likely scenario. But we just had the markets do a perfect, what I call, fourth wave bounce after that really nasty third wave crash, which should be the worst we see regardless. Um, and, and we should be ready. We should have you know, be heading down to retest those lows on March 23rd, or more likely even make a new low. Well, that could have happened, you know, uh, middle of last week, you know, April 1st to 3rd. Started to look like a nasty crash, but then the markets came back into the day on Friday and this morning. And you know the reason why? The markets are seeing the same thing I've been warning about, this virus is already decelerating in Italy and most of Europe, and about to start to in the United States and the epicenter here, New York. The markets are seeing that over the weekend, and that's why they're bouncing. So that increases the odds that we could see, we could have seen the bottom on March 23rd. I still think there's going to be an attempt to retest um, and still potentially a new low. Now, now, now that the virus is decelerating more obviously, which was obvious to us two weeks ago, looking on the S-curve analysis, which the experts have caught up to. I don't worry about the experts now. Governor Cuomo in New York is saying the same thing we are. By Within seven days of the other day, like about April 10th, they should be at their peak and heading down. It's exactly what my S-curve model and some other ones suggest. So, so that's not going to be the reason. If this virus starts to flare up in Africa and Africa's starting to lock down. You know who that's a problem for? China. Their supply chain and China supplies the rest of the world with manufactured goods. So, so that's a problem. Or, or India, which is in a strict lockdown. If they blow up, if it starts to reach the emerging world, which it hasn't yet, but it has decelerated here. Now, again, here's the most important issue. Here's the number one number I constantly quote to wake people up to what has happened here and what is the threat. It's not the recession, it's not the virus, it's the greatest debt and more important financial asset bubble in history because we already had the greatest in the 2007 as we predicted. And when the GFC or the Great Recession hit, uh, central banks did something unique. They decided to print unlimited amounts of money to stop the deleveraging process, the very process that makes the economy healthy by eliminating bad zombie banks, eliminating unproductive debt, eliminating unproductive companies, and even unproductive workers, or switching people from unproductive industries to productive ones. This is how we get 
healthy by little recessions along the way. And when we don't have enough of those, which the central banks always stops like they did uh, from 1913 to 1929, no accident. They get created in 1913, and we have the greatest bubble in history up to that point, and then the greatest depression, which is a deleveraging or detox, I always like to call it in health terms. Getting rid of bad stuff, which is painful. There is no beautiful deleveraging, as Ray uh, Dalio. There are better ways to do it, but there's no beautiful deleveraging in this situation. It is painful by nature. So here's what's happened. Normally, of course, debt would deleverage, and we've got tons of debt in the world, 80, 90 trillion more than we had at the top in 2007 before the Great Recession. But that's not the big problem here. That's not the big hurdle for central banks and the world to get over. We now have 330 trillion approximately of financial assets, which includes loans, stocks, bonds, loans, largely, and other financial assets. 330 trillion. That is four times global GDP in the US. My other important number, about 125 trillion, six times our GDP, since our stock market is so highly valued and so large in the world scene. That's the problem for central banks here. They created this monster by not just trying to lower interest rates and get banks to loan more, which creates more consumer and business spending and investment, and consumer inflation, no, that didn't work. They could see that wasn't gonna work in 2009, so they ended up going to QE, which means you just directly push money into the financial asset pools of stocks, real estate, commodities, mortgages, loans, all this sort of stuff, bonds. And so we have the greatest financial asset bubble in history. 330 trillion, when people have told me, two things people have told me constantly against what I've been saying. First of all, Harry, central banks will never let that first 40% crash happen. They will be ahead of it. No, it's happening and it's happened and it may happen more near term. They, this is so big, a mountain of assets deleveraging. Stocks globally in just a couple of weeks, 15 to 20 trillion disappeared. That's just the appetizer, not even that, hasn't even hit real estate yet, and bonds and a lot of other assets, although it is starting to hit corporate bonds and junk bonds. So that's the bugaboo here. By avoiding this healthy, painful deleveraging, which has always happened in recessions and happened in spades in the Great Depression. How do you think we came out of the Great Depression so dramatically instead of so weakly this time? And another one of my favorite graphs, when I look at real GDP cumulative from the top in 29 to the top in 2007 into today, we are lower cumulative. Yes, much bigger crash in 29 to 32, 33, but much more forceful recovery. Add it all up, we are not as good as we were at the end of that depression 10, 11, 12 years later like today. And we've yet to see the worst of it because we push it off. Pushing off a crisis only makes it worth worse. You don't get something for nothing. Fundamental tenement. If you don't get that, you're in trouble here. So people also say, Harry, central banks will just print ever more money. And of course they will. And of course they just did. We just went a week or so ago Unlimited QE, five trillion uh, repo credit line, total across the board buying of QE, not just treasury bills. Anymore. This is full out. The central banks, especially the Fed in this case, have blown their entire wad, zero rates and unlimited money printing right at the beginning of this crisis. You know why? They're that scared of the economy because they know better than anybody. They've been stimulating beyond anything they could have imagined or anybody could have imagined back in 2008, eight, nine. And you can't get this damn economy to grow much more than 2% or one and a half in Europe or 1% in Japan. What does that tell you? What does 30 years of a winter season and no spring, no rebound in real estate in Japan, stocks only going about halfway back and ready to fall again. What does it tell you? This does not work. And why can't the central banks print unlimited amount of money? Because we have an unlimited amount of financial assets, which do what? 
Bubbles only burst. By creating this great bubble, they have created something that deleverages faster than debt does in a downturn. And banks writing off loans and restructuring loans. That takes a while. Financial assets can go boom like we just saw. So what the battle's gonna be from here on out, off and on, the financial assets just won this round. They, they destroyed more wealth. And I'm just talking stocks, 15 to 20 trillion. It's got to be 30 trillion more. In a few weeks, then the central banks turn around and print it in response. But then there'll be a rebound. One, now that the virus danger looks increasingly over, if it doesn't erupt somewhere else, as I said, in the third world, we're going to have a rebound with all this stimulus and people saying, oh, thinking like I said at the beginning, oh, this was just the virus. Now it's back to normal. Let me tell you something. I went through the freaking hurricane in Puerto Rico. That's more like the virus. It's a short term event. It's a shock. It threw Puerto Rico into a sudden depression. Everything stopped. I had to move, my wife and I had to move to New York for three months because it was totally dysfunctional and we came back. It was not a V-shaped recovery. It was very you. A lot of businesses went under, never came back because they were weak or too much in debt. A lot of restaurants gave it up, just took the insurance and ran. I had seven great restaurants within a block and a half of me and only one of them's left. Of 21, Total restaurants, including the crappy ones, over a third of them are gone, never came back. So the bigger picture here is the most over-indebted, greatest financial asset bubble-driven economy, a totally artificial bubble for the first time fully in history to go to new highs, created totally by trillions and trillions, about $20 trillion being put in to financial market, not into the banking system, not given to consumers like they're just starting to do now. It just created a financial asset bubble. It has nothing to do with Wall Street. So that financial bubble can burst dramatically and it will. What does history say these, the stocks will do? Down 80, 90%, I'm talking blue chip. Already in this first crash, we've seen the S&P down 35% at worst, the Russell 2000 small caps 44%, and still the leaders the NASDAQ, the tech stocks down 32%. One more whack and then we're clearly into this 40% plus, but we've already had enough of a first crash, even if that was it. So what's the next story? We get this rebound three to five months historically. It could be a little longer because of the election in the US and Trump's gonna pull out all stops fiscally, which they've already started to do as well. By the way, six trillion when you add up all the fiscal stimulus, loans to businesses and, 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 and checks to consumers and all this sort of stuff. And we've been running a one trillion or 6% of GDP, 6% a year of our GDP is stimulus and we're still growing at two, two and a half percent at best. The hell does that tell you? We have a dead economy. That's the real story. This economy's dead, overstimulated, over manipulated, overstretched. And you know what type of correction we had in the stock market with the worst virus in all of modern history, not the Black Plague in the Dark Ages, Renaissance. The Spanish flu killed 50 million guests because they didn't have good figures. Five million infected at least. You know how much the stock market went down at the worst when that flu was at its worst in 1918? 10%. Because it wasn't overvalued because we were in World War I. And in reality, factories were not shutting down at the speed of light like this because people had to produce for the war. It is this bubble that makes the economy and this endless debt bubble and financial asset bubble, these twin bubbles, especially financial assets, that puts this economy so vulnerable that this is the perfect trigger and we do not come back from this. That's what I'm telling you. Do not think it's over because the virus is receding. And second of all, it could come back in the winter like the Spanish flu did, bigger than ever. May or may not. I think we're more prepared this time and I think it's more likely to come back in emerging countries or maybe even spread near term. But the point is, see the big picture here. The real story here is the greatest debt in financial asset bubble in history can't even compare the global nature, the extent of debt, 
in financial assets as a percentage of GDP, U.S. financial assets as a percentage of GDP are double what they've ever been at the most overvalued time, double any time in history back to World War II. That's the story. This is going to break down because there is no recovery. This will show the vulnerabilities of this over-indebted, over-stimulated economy with demographic trends worse than they were when we started in 2007, eight. We're at the top of the baby boom spending curve here then and in most countries around the world. It hit 2011 in Europe. China also 2011 peaked and turned out. Japan, long time ago. All of this gets exposed and there's wounds made and a lot of businesses don't come back. And a lot of aging baby boomers who are that close to retirement or some of them just people just came back from the Great Recession when they gave up and came back in the workforce finally and then bam, this shock. We could have 15, 20% in unemployment in just the next quarter or so before we have some relief from that in the election. And then it goes back down that or deeper. We are in the Great Depression, the next Great Depression. We are in the 90 year bubble burst and great reset cycle. Really just a few months behind the one, the peak in 1929 on that same cycle. This is what's happening, not the freaking virus. But I love the virus because money printing doesn't stop this thing. So I want you to think very hard about who you're listening to here. There are other people been warning about this crisis for years. I call them the gold bugs as a general label. And there's the more intelligent ones. And then there's just like the ones that are, you know, preaching the end of the world. And, and you know, this is God's punishment for this or that. These people understand better than economists, that you can't borrow your way to prosperity, but they do not understand the very process that follows every debt and financial asset bubble in history called deleveraging or detox. People in the addiction industries understand it. Detox is painful. No beautiful deleveraging there. There's better ways to do it or not. But if you're going to get bad stuff out of the body or out of the economy, it's going to be painful, but it's the only way to get healthy and get back to a normal economy. And that takes years. My targets are the same I had from the beginning. First 40% crash, we're on that, give or take. Rebound three, five months, maybe longer. And then a two year plus painful, more drudging downturn. And that's the real market crash. That's the real deleveraging happening. After banks and central banks tried to avoid this and they just couldn't because the deleveraging of that 330 trillion up to, I guess, estimating by past, and I may even be conservative here, half of that, 160 trillion disappear, two times global GDP. In the US, remember that number I started with? 125 trillion, half of that disappeared. 60 some trillion, three times our GDP. They just aren't gonna be able to print money that fast. And they've already lost credibility. The most important thing that happened, from my view, other than this first 40% crash, when nobody said it could happen, is the other thing people said couldn't happen. Central banks would just create, keep printing vastly more amounts of money and keep doing it. And I said, no, at some point, it'll look so ridiculous, they will lose credibility. Two Mondays back, after the Fed made its greatest single monetary pledge and injection in all of history. Stock market, the Dow went down 3,000 points the next day. They're like, you know, been there, done that. This doesn't work anymore. They only responded to the fiscal stimulus a little bit. And now, as I said weeks ago, they'll only really respond because the real short-term crisis of the virus, when they see this virus receding in Europe, Italy first, then Europe, then the US, particularly New York here. And, and that's all happening. So this is all going to plan. There is a pattern to this, regardless of whether it's the virus that triggers it or not. The virus makes it worse, first shock. The virus, if it comes back, when it would come back, right around election time in the cold weather, it could make the next downturn worse. But it's not the fundamental trend. And as Andy Pancholi said in one of his updates, viruses come on about an 18-year cycle. This is the 90 year cycle. Do not forget that. And if you think 
after listening to me as long as you may have, and hopefully for a good while, most of you, you think you can't decide whether I'm right or somebody like Peter Schiff, then you need to go. Take, go to the doctor, go to the emergency room and take your temperature. You may just have the Morana virus. Just kidding, but serious at the same time. You got to get clear here. History is on my side, and I've studied this more than anybody I know now. Not just cycles, but what happens when major pervasive debt and financial asset bubbles deleverage, and it's very clear, deflation is always the outcome. Hyperinflation has never happened on a global level, only to one big country, Germany, after being devastated in debt and bankrupt after World War I, and then put reparations. People go, Venezuela today, or Germany back then, go into hyperinflation because they're printing money feverishly to pay bills they can't pay. That's not what's happening here. Money's being printed to stimulate financial assets so they go up and at least make the top 10, 20% feel wealthier so they'll spend more money while Homer Simpson's not. That's how you get 2% growth instead of 4%. The upper crust is spending 4% plus. Everyday people aren't spending more and some are spending less. You can't win this battle. The economy's dead. We've done the defibrillator. We've shocked it like so many times now. There's a time when you just say, as the doctors say on the emergency room show, time of death. Well, time of death, March 2020. Now we have to go through the deleveraging and recreate this economy. And it's the only thing that will make us stronger. This is a good thing. And if you listen to us, and not the gold bugs who are going to tell you that the dollar's going to go down and all currencies are going to crash and gold's going to go up. They have been wrong every time. Now, gold has done better than most commodities. It's only been down 45% at worst. We call the bounce there. It's gone farther. Well, I'm saying it could go to 1800 now. I can correct my forecast. Gold will do the same thing it did in 2008, go up in the early stages because it sees a crisis. And then when they see it's deflation and not inflation, which is what gold correlates with, 100% long-term, it goes down. It just did it here. This crash, first three or four, it was going up into the crash first three or four days. It goes up six, seven percent. Then it crashes down 10%. Gold is not the safe haven here. The U.S. dollar is, and Bitcoin is not either. It will be the next big thing, but it'll go down with this bubble first. So that's what's happening here. The U.S. dollar and the highest quality treasury bonds. And I'll give you one more piece of advice, which I'm going to move forward in. We would have said, you know, that the 10, 30 year treasury bonds and the AAA corporates and munis would have been the place to be. Well, you know what? AAA corporate bonds didn't do so well because a lot of AAA companies and in, 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 in cruise ships, travel, retail, all airlines are down 50 to 80%. AAA means nothing when you're down that much. So AAA bonds, corporate bonds went down almost much as junk bonds. So in the next rebound, preparing for the next longer term downturn, I'm going to be leaning more towards the safer treasuries at first and other government bonds, not many around the world, including potentially Australian bonds, maybe German, maybe not. I will look to get in the corporate AAA later when it's proven that the virus doesn't come back and cause this type of shock, shock shark, um, <laughs> when the virus doesn't cause this kind of shock again, that's indiscriminate and hits everything. Um, then we can get at those because those will do well in the end too. So again, I'm asking you to listen to me. You can still listen to Peter Schiff or the gold bugs if you want. I'm just telling you, I'm going to be right about this. Only reason I look at history, they are in ideology and they're playing the last crisis. The inflation season, I call it. Stagflation, recession from downturn in demographic spending with high inflation from low productivity. That's not what's happening now. We have excess capacity everywhere in the world. This is why corporations have been buying back their own stocks with cheap money instead of expanding capacity. We don't need it. China's the most. So this is the crisis. Deleveraging, getting rid of excess capacity, unproductive debt, unproductive companies, this will make us healthy again. And we don't have to be like Japan where it takes 30 years in a winter downturn from bubbles bursting and demographic trends bursting first there and never going to spring. We can go back to spring in the early 2020s if 
we take this crisis and we're going to tell you how to make money in it instead of getting your assets kicked. So stay tuned.